Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink, and I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me, I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you, you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? When did we see you, you a stranger, and take you in, or naked, and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it for one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. And he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into the everlasting punishment, but the righteous into the eternal life. Good morning. In the latter half of Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about the imminence of his return. He promises that he's going to return someday. And he warns us that we can't know when he's going to, to come back. And then in Matthew chapter 25, he gives us some parables to teach us some important facts about his return and, and how we should prepare for it. He gives us the parable of the virgins, the ten virgins, the five that were prepared and the five that were unprepared when the bridegroom came. He then goes on and gives the parable of the talents to talk about or point out the fact that while our Lord is gone, we need to be working, and we need to be doing all that we are able to do to further his kingdom, because one day he's going to return and take account. And then at the end of Matthew chapter 25, in the passage which was read for us in verses 31 to 46, Jesus gives a description, if you will, of what will happen when he returns. And this is our text this morning from which we want to study Actually, most of our time is going to be spent on verse 31. Because very, a great deal is said in verse 31 of Matthew chapter 25. And so, first of all, we want to note, it says in verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Number one, as we begin to examine this passage, we see that... The coming of Jesus is a certainty. We see the certainty of his return. We know, of course, that God always keeps his promises. We don't have to worry about the fact that God will, about whether or not God will keep the promises that he has made. We know from passages such as Titus 1 and verse 2, Paul says that God cannot lie. And so if God says something is going to occur, it's going to occur. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, in regard to the coming of Jesus, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, 
But he's long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In the context of that passage, Peter is talking about the return of the Lord. And some would say, well, you know, so much time has passed and he hasn't returned. Evidently, he's not going to return. And Peter wants us to understand the Lord keeps his promises. And if he has promised that he's going to return, then indeed he will return. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 that God is faithful. He's faithful to the promises that he makes. As we look at the the stories that were told in the Old Testament about people who trusted in God and and obeyed God, even though um, God didn't always give them all the information that they might need and He required them to do things sometimes that maybe they didn't understand. We read in, in Hebrews 11 and verse 6 that one of the requirements of faith is a trust in God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11 is a chapter we call the Hall of Fame of Faith. And it lists several people from the Old Testament who did that very thing. They believed in God and they believed that God was a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And so if God makes a promise, we can know that he will keep that promise. And one of God's promises to us is that Jesus is going to return someday. We have that message from the mouth of God's messengers in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. When Jesus had ascended up into heaven before the disciples... And we have them looking up into heaven and angels then standing beside them and saying, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now granted, this wasn't a voice speaking from heaven. It wasn't the Father himself speaking, but these angels were the messengers sent by the Father. And these angels told the disciples, yes, you've seen Jesus ascend up into heaven and know that one day he's going to descend in like manner. We have also Jesus himself making that promise. In John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus there says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. He says, I'm going to prepare a place. And the fact that I'm going to prepare a place, it it ought to tell you that I'm, I'm preparing it for a purpose. I'm preparing it for you. And so one day I'm going to come back. And I'm going to get you and you're going to be where I am in this place that I am preparing for you. Back in Matthew 24 and verse 44, Jesus says, You also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So we have the promise from Jesus himself. The angels told the disciples he's coming back just like you've seen him go. Jesus himself has promised that he's coming back. And then also we have the Apostle Paul. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. We see the certainty of Jesus' return. It doesn't say in Matthew 25 and verse 31 that uh, the Son of Man might one day come in His glory or if the Son of Man comes in His glory, but rather it says when the Son of Man comes in His glory. We have the certainty of Jesus' return. Number two, in this passage, we know that when Jesus returns, His return will be in glory. His return will be in glory. 
We know, of course, that the first time he came to this earth as a man, he came in a very humble form. In Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7, the Apostle Paul wrote, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Being the Son of God, he could have come into any situation that he desired here on earth. He could have been born to a king. He could have lived in a palace and had a very easy life, physically speaking, but he didn't. He came in the form of a bondservant, in the form of a humble servant. His first appearance on earth was very humble in nature. We're told that he gave up the riches of heaven, that he might become poor for us in 2 Corinthians 8, in verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich in heaven, yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. Not only did he come into a, a very humble family, we're told that as he grew into adulthood and he began his ministry, at one point he made the statement, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Luke 9 and verse 58. So even as he, he is he's a grown man and he's doing his ministry, he's doing the will of God, he even at this point has not obtained any wealth. He certainly is not rich. And so throughout all of his life, he had very humble origins. But when he comes the second time, Jesus said there in Matthew 25 and verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, and then he'll sit on the throne of his glory. His second return, his second coming to the earth is not going to be like the first. In the first, he was born in a small town in Bethlehem and And yes, there were angels who announced to the shepherds and to others that Jesus was born. But really, when you get down to it, it was a very humble beginning for the Messiah here on the earth. But when he comes back, we're told, number one, that every eye will see him when he returns. Revelation 1 and verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds. And every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Remember the disciples were told, you're going to see him return in like manner as you've seen him ascend. Well, the disciples have all died. They're they're no longer alive and living on the earth today. But even they are going to see him when he returns. We're told that those who pierced him on the cross will see him when he returns. You know, there are certain religious groups out there who try to tell us that Jesus has already returned. And they say that he has done it in secret. And that's why nobody knows that he's returned. But here we read in verse 7 of Revelation 1 that every eye is going to see him when he returns. Everyone will know. And it also points out that there will be those of the earth that mourn because of him. Why is that? Because they know that they're unprepared. They know that they've been wrong in denying Jesus. And now there's going to be an accounting. We have, in, again, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, a passage which we've already read. It also points out the glory of His coming. The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. A loud announcement that all will hear and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God will sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. Again, he's coming in glory with great power and demonstration of his power. And Paul also wrote in 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 7 through 9 about his return. He says that when the Lord returns, it says the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. 
He's coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not the Lord and obey not the gospel. His first appearance on earth was very humble in nature. When he comes back again, he's coming back with his angels. He's coming back with a shout and the trumpet of God is going to sound. And he's going to take vengeance on those who know not God. And we also read that those who are faithful and obedient to him will go to be with him when he comes. So when he returns, it's going to be in glory. We're also told, number three, that when he returns, he will sit on the throne of his glory. He will sit on the throne of his glory. This is a reference to his judgment throne. The fact that he's going to judge mankind. And certainly the scriptures do set forth that one day all of us are going to stand before God in judgment. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, Paul said we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Again, it doesn't matter at what point that we lived on this earth, whether we lived during the lifetime of Jesus or before Jesus or even now or whenever the Lord returns, all people are one day going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And when we do that, we're going to receive the things that we've done in our bodies. In other words, we're going to answer for ourselves according to what we have done, not according to what our parents have done, Not according to what our children have done, but according to what we have done, our actions, our beliefs, we're going to be judged by the Lord. In John chapter 5, Jesus talks a good deal about the fact that he's going to judge mankind. Verses 21 to 30, I want to read. He says, for as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. That all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Again, we, we could easily make a sermon out of that passage and everything that Jesus says in that passage. But we're going to just note, verse 22, Jesus pointed out that all judgment had been committed to the Son. When Jesus returns, we're, we're not going to be judged by the Father. We're going to be judged by the Son because He is the one that God has set aside or appointed for that task. Verse 24 points out, that those who hear the words of Jesus will not come into judgment. He says, but they pass from death to life. And what, that doesn't mean that we're not going to be judged. But what he's referring to is we're not going to be found guilty. We've passed from death unto life. We're going to be forgiven of all of our sins. And, and we'll be a, allowed into heaven, if you will. That's what he means when he says that we will not come into judgment. In verse 27, we read that Jesus was given the authority to judge because of the fact that he was the Son of Man. His willingness to become a human and live as a man and go through all of the struggles and all of the trials that a human has to endure 
eminently qualifies him to be our judge. You may remember the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 4 says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are. That was a reference to Jesus. And he can sympathize with us because he's lived in flesh. He knows what it's like to be tempted. And so that is why he is our judge, because he can sympathize. We, we're not going to be able, when we go to the judgment, to say, God, you just don't understand what it's like to be a human. You don't know our struggles. You don't know our trials. Here you are up in heaven. And you have everything that you want. And everything's wonderful here. How can you sit there and judge us? We can't do that. Because the second person of the Godhead does know. And he lived here on earth and was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's why he's our judge. And then in verse 30, we can read, or we can rest assured, that his judgment will be righteous. I don't know about you, but I'm very grateful that I'm not the judge. And I'm, it's, it's very heartening for me to know that I don't have to decide a person's fate. Jesus will. Jesus who knows the heart of man. Jesus who is part of the Godhead, knows the very number of hairs on our head, knows our thoughts before we think them. He is going to be the judge, and He is a righteous judge. When Jesus returns, we're going to stand before Him in judgment. He'll sit on His throne of glory. And then the final point that I want to bring out, and this really sort of deals with the rest of that passage in Matthew 25. We see the standard of judgment that Jesus is going to use. In our passage, the difference between the sheep and the goats was how they treated their fellow man. Those who had shown love and compassion to their fellow man were allowed to enter into heaven. Those who had not shown love and compassion to their fellow man were sent to eternal punishment. Jesus told us that when we stand before him in judgment, we're going to be judged according to his word. John 12 and verse 48. He said there, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So we're going to be judged by his word, by his his teaching. And certainly it can be said that in a nutshell, his doctrine, his teaching is one of love. At one point he was asked what was the greatest commandment in the law. In Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40. And it says that when he was asked that, he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then Jesus went a little bit further and gave the second greatest commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We are to love God first. We are to love others second. God is our priority. And then we're to love others as we love ourselves. Jesus said, on those two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You go back to the law that was given to the nation of Israel. And all the regulations that they were given and how they were to treat their their fellow man. And all of the commands to sacrifice and uh, make, give offerings and, and all of those things can be boiled down into these two commandments. Love God and love your fellow man. Love toward God is always shown through obedience to His will. Love for God is always shown through obedience to His will. You show me an individual who says, I love God, but yet they are disobedient to the will of God on a continuing basis. I'm not saying someone who stumbles occasionally, but someone who says, yes, I love God, but they're not a member of the Lord's church. They never worship the Lord. They never 
uh, do the things that God has commanded, and I'm, I'm telling you, they do not love the Lord. John wrote to the elect lady in 2 John, in verses 5 and 6, he says, And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. What is the commandment that was given? Well, it was love. It was love. And we know that that includes loving God and loving man. And our love for God, he says, is demonstrated when we walk according to his commandments. We can't love God, really, if we aren't obedient to his will. Our love towards man is shown by our actions and by our compassion that we show on those who are in need. 1 John 3, 16 through 19. Love's, love toward man is shown through compassion. Here, John writes, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Now, first of all, John said there in verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. God demonstrates his love for us by Jesus dying on the cross. And now John says our love has to be demonstrated. When we see individuals, brothers or sisters who are in need, somebody who needs our help, and we're able to help that individual, we demonstrate our love by treating that individual like we would want to be treated, by helping. And so, again, we can't really claim that we love our brothers or sisters if we know that they're in need and we do nothing to help them. These are some of the things that we're going to be held accountable for when we go to the judgment. And that leads to the last point I want to make here. And that is this. It takes more than just doctrinal purity to get to heaven. Do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that doctrinal purity is unimportant because it is. You cannot read the New Testament honestly and unbiased and come to the conclusion that what we believe is unimportant. Read especially Paul's writings and how much he deals with doctrinal matters and, and, and how we worship and how we conduct ourselves. Those things are important and certainly we have to believe the right things. Those things are important, but... From this passage, I think we see that it's possible to believe all the right things and still be lost if we have not love. And that then leads to 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. Now, in this passage, the Apostle Paul is dealing with the abuse of miraculous gifts. People were getting puffed up over the ability to, to do these miraculous things, and as you could imagine. And he wants them to understand that more important than these gifts is love. And he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Brethren, we can believe all the right things and still be lost. If we don't love our fellow man, if we don't love and obey God, 
and obey His commands. The song that Dan led for us before I came up, Oh, how sweet twill be to meet the Lord when He comes in glory by and by. What a song of praise will be outpoured when He comes in glory by and by. Let me ask you, when you think about the return of the Lord, when He comes in glory, does that stir within your heart great joy and happiness? Or does it cause fear and trepidation because you don't know or maybe you do know that you're not ready for that day to come. The song that we're about to sing as an invitation song is entitled, When Jesus Comes. When Jesus comes, are you going to be ready? Are you a sheep or are you a goat? Are you going to hear, well done, enter in or depart from me? I never knew you. The answer, of course, lies in how you conduct your life here on this this earth. You're still breathing and the Lord hasn't returned yet, so it's not too late for you. If you do not feel that you're ready for the Lord's return, then by all means, do what needs to be done. If you're already a member of the Lord's church, but you're, you're unsure, then repent of the sin that's in your life and ask God's forgiveness and He'll give it. But maybe there are some here who are not member of the Lord's church. You've never obeyed the gospel. That's what you need to do first. Just as Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, you must die to sin. Repent of sin in your life. Be buried in the waters of baptism and then arise to walk in newness of life, confessing your faith in Jesus as the Son of God. If you've not done that, you need to do that. Because the Lord's coming. We don't know when, but He's coming back someday. And we're going to stand before Him in judgment. Are you ready? If there's any way we can help, please come as we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.